Hardeep Singh is a fighter both in the ring and outside of it. He's battled internal issues throughout his adolescence and has come out on top by seeking his truth and purpose in life. In this interview, Hardeep talks about his MMA career and coming out of retirement to fight again. On Saturday, January 13th at the Hard Rock Casino in Coquitlam, Hardeep faces off against Keegan Oliver. The reason why the 43-year-old is coming out of retirement to fight again is to raise awareness for those without a voice. Hardeep also talks about his spiritual awakening towards veganism and why he became a plant-based fighter. He's an incredibly passionate dude and that's one of the reasons why I didn't edit any external videos into this interview. And this is my interview with MMA fighter Hardeep Singh. You're listening to the Block E Podcast. My name is Hardeep Singh, uh, born and raised in Vancouver, BC, uh, 43 years old, old fart, I've been around, um, started training 13 years ago with uh, Mr. Chris Franco at FKP MMA, and uh, yeah, became uh, Stop Eating Animals at uh, about six, in October of 2011, so what is that, six years now, six years ago, and uh, yeah, Feel like a million bucks. What got me started in there? I was always fighting in the streets. A bit of a Napoleon complex, I guess you could say. You know, small man syndrome. I don't know. Could be a number of things, but you know, you grow up and you're hanging out with a rowdy crowd. Nobody, you know, people bump into you and they think you're nothing, and then you got something to prove. And you know, people don't show you that respect that they do to the other these other guys that I would hang out with. So. You know, and, and back then it was, uh, you know, you got a problem with someone, you fight it out. You shake hands after, you go for a drink, but, you know, I never drank before, so I just get a water, no big deal. Anyways, uh, yeah, so I ended up getting to one fight where uh, somebody got hurt really bad, and I was looking at getting in some serious trouble, and then it changed my life. Started thinking differently, uh, approaching life differently. And then, uh, yeah, I, I didn't go out for a while after that. I was actually very shook about that, that I actually did something like that to cause somebody harm like that. Anyways, and then a buddy of mine called me one day and asked me if he wanted to go box with him at, uh, at a gym. And uh, I said, yeah, don't even have to ask twice, let's go. And then uh, we ended up coming here to FKP MMA. And I, actually, I already knew Chris, Mr. Franco. I already knew him from the clubs, obviously. <laughs> Um, and going out and mutual friends and uh, you know I walked in here and he's like we chit chatted for a bit and uh, there was a tall skinny little guy here and Chris said here go beat him up and I didn't really know what I was doing I just came in here and I was like okay and then the guy took me down I was a fish out of water caught me in an arm bar I was like, oh, it hurts, it hurts. <laughs> and then uh, Chris told him to let it go, and let, he let it go. And I, I was pretty humbled by the experience. And it made me fall in love with the sport that this skinny guy that I thought I'll pretzel actually did that to me. So I was like, I told myself, I'm never going to let that ever happen again from this guy. So that was the day it all started and never looked back. And... The sport is good, it teaches people humility and it humbles people and you learn the words of respect, honor, integrity, these things that actually have value and purpose. People talk a lot of shit and talk about honor and peace and love and all this other bullshit that spews out of their mouth but it's one thing to say, it's like the assholes, everyone's got one, anybody can do it. But when it comes down to walking the walk, whole different ball game. I don't really think I have a particular style. I, I just, uh, when you start fighting, I mean, so everyone's different. I, I don't really know what my style is. I just kind of go with the flow and it, I, I do know when I get hit, like good, I get angry and then I just, I don't know, I just go into a blind rage. <laughs> it's probably not the best way to do things, but uh, is, you know, fighting, fighting is very instinctive. It's, um, you know, the guys that uh, make it to the top tier of this sport, you know, they're very well in control of their emotions, most of them. Um, you know, they have game plans, they execute their game plan, they follow it to a T, they keep their emotions in check. 
but you know I'm not um, you know I do this as a passion it's not it's not work for me it's not a it's not a job it's a hobby you know fighting doesn't pay the bills so that's what a lot of people don't seem to actually you know some people most people understand that but then there's a lot of people that think they're gonna make it somewhere with it but you know there's a lot of tough dudes out there they're all experiences and, and most of it has to do with the audience it's like how loud did they cheer? Did they boo? <laughs> I remember. I remember more that than the actual fight itself. Um, but you know, it's it's just uh, everyone's a little different. They they take different things from it. Even after the fight, I don't, don't even remember it until I see it on video, and then even I get surprised. Oh, I did that! Wow. So it's a, you know, a lot of it's based on instinct and um, just the way you train is the way you behave most of the time. So, you know, the way it goes. You know, like most people, Mike Tyson was the, um, the biggest role model. I actually understood him more than everyone else. And every time he'd go crazy and do something, I'd be like, yeah, I'd do that too. Because I was just there when you grow up with a troubled childhood and a really destructive uh, past and everything is all violent and uh, evil and very, uh, no guidance and all, all these things that make you become something, you, you know, you become what you, what you see. So if you see violence every day, you become that. And that's, that's how you live life. And you, you don't see it as abnormal when really in a world of people that have kids are very peaceful, calm, oh, don't do this, don't do that. But then if you're doing all these things that you enjoy doing and destroying shit, and then nobody's there to tell you it's wrong, don't do that. You don't understand that it's wrong. You just keep doing it and it grows. It grows inside you because that's what you know. And so when Mike Tyson would go crazy, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I do that, oh, I do that. And then, um, it's funny because when I watch him fight, I'd be like, man, that guy's a god. And, and it, even all the crazy shit he did, when he bit uh, Holyfield's ear off, I was like, yeah, I'd do that too if he was headbutting me. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, that guy's playing dirty. He deserves that. But everyone else is like, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. And I'm like, you know, it's just, anyways. Um, Guys like Mike Tyson, one thing that you could say about him that you can't say about 99% of the people on this planet doesn't lie. So if he says he didn't do something, he didn't do it. And if he says he did it and he knows it's wrong, he'll admit it. Because that's who he is. When you're not scared of anything, you don't lie. People only lie when they're scared of something. So it's the, I, always have, it's, I always understood that guy. But uh, then I saw Roy Jones man that guy was just what the f wow so i went from punching like mike tyson hitting the heavy bag and boxing with friends in their basements and sparring and it wasn't even sparring back then we were kids and we just tried to go nuts and then roy jones came around and it's like holy i want to be like that guy it was just so fun to watch and then uh, so you know i tried to more be the roy jones style but, you know, I mean, nobody's ever going to be Roy Jones, except for maybe Lomachenko. But uh, at the same time, it's just... Now I idolize Lomachenko. I'm like, man, this guy is so amazing what he does. But, uh, so yeah, boxing is... I idolize more boxing guys than MMA guys. Um, I think boxing is so much harder than MMA. In, in a sense where it comes down to millimeters, and MMA is like inches, but uh, in one aspect, MMA is harder. In the other aspect, uh, boxing is harder. So it, it's, you know, they're two different sports. It's like jujitsu with a gi and without gi, it's two different sports. You can it's hard to compare the two, right? The first time I got humbled and put my place when I said that was when I was sitting at the keg one day. There was, a, there was a table full of guys and a couple of girls, and the one girl said, we were talking about how much we love animals and this and that. And I'm sitting there eating my steak, and I'm like, oh, I love animals so much, and blah, blah, blah. And this girl's like, shut the fuck up. And I looked at her like, what's your problem? She's like, no, you don't, you piece of shit, you fucking hypocrite, you blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what's up? Whoa, what are you doing? What are you, what's wrong with you? What is your problem? I, did, I didn't get it because I never seen 
I'm looking at the food, but not making sense of what she saw and what she knew. I didn't know that. So what came out of her mouth, it made no sense to me. And so um, I remember that, that I was confused, utter confusion brought up. You're not told anything. You're not shown anything. So in my head, I'm like, what? What? I'm sitting there like an idiot. But she was right the whole time. I was the dumb one. I was the ignorant one. I was the uneducated one. And then, uh, yeah, that, that was the first time. I actually, my mind opened a bit, but I still didn't understand it because I'd never seen it with my own eyes. So, yeah, that was, um, that was the first time was the, the experience of this whole world and the way it was and the disconnect and all the hidden all the truth that's hidden away from us because it makes us feel shitty and then there's no money involved because then you're like I don't want to support that so you don't end up spending your money and government you know governments and these food corporations are give us your money give us your money we don't care about anything else give us your money we don't care if you get sick we don't care about the animals we don't care about the world we don't care about climate change we don't care about anything no morals anyways next question I think I was maybe like 25 or 28 or something. I can't remember exactly how old it was. So th this, is, this, is, this is a little bit weird. Um, and back then I was up to no good and like causing a lot of shit all over the city and hanging out with a lot of bad people and just running amok with all these people. And um, so I'm cruising down Camby Street and I got up to 12th and Camby going towards downtown. This is, you know, normal time to go out. I see this Honda Civic in front of me. And I don't know why I was in a pissy mood that day. I was just in a I remember I was in a pissy mood and I just, I don't know, I was being a dick for no reason, just an idiot. And there was a Civic in front of me. And I had a sticker on it. And it said the Cove. It's a Cove. And I see these four people, two a guy and a girl in the back, a guy and a girl in the front. And I'm like, these geeks, right? All laughing and dancing in the car. And I'm like, they're having fun, whatever. What the fuck is the cove? I'm thinking in my head. I don't even know why. It was just like, what the fuck is that? And so I uh, actually backed up and rolled up beside him. I'm like, roll the window down. And they were so nice. Hey, man, how's it going? How's your night? And I'm like, hey, what's up, guys? Uh, you guys having a good time? That's good. That's good. Hey, what's the cove? And I'm like, what's the cove? And they all started saying the same thing. Oh my God, you need to watch it. You have to watch it. Everyone in the world should have to watch this. It'll change your life, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, man, shut the fuck up. You guys don't even know what you're talking about, man. You guys, you guys are lost. But really, I was the lost one. And then uh, they're like, man, we hope you have a good night. And they're being just the nicest people. And I was just like, yeah, I hope you guys actually have a good, good night and uh, wish you guys the best because they were so nice. So I was like, okay, please, you know, have a good night. And uh, so I went my own way, and they went their own way. But, you know, I, I didn't give a fuck still. Cold. Well, what the fuck is that, right? The cold sounds like something I would see a Leon the, the Caprio movie or something, like the beach, I'm thinking, right? So sure enough, like, I don't know, four or five, six years later, in 2011, it happened, man. I was at home. It was a Sunday night. Yeah, it was storming that night, there was lightning, it was pissing, rain and hail. And it was October, it was cold out, it was shitty out. And at that time, we didn't have berries, we just had a regular phones. I think it was regular phones, it was like just starting text matches, texting just started or something. No, I think it was still phone calls back then. Anyways. Uh... You know, I call everyone that normally comes out. Nobody was calling me back. Nobody was answering their phones. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? I need to go out. I need, it's either the Roxy or there was another club on Sundays that was open back then. I can't remember what it was though, but it's usually the Roxy and then just kind of go and see what else is cracking. But it was just weird. Like half the channels weren't working on TV and, you know, there was no digital... Uh, it wasn't like cable now, it was like shitty TV and like TV Guide and that's kind of it. Um, so I saw that on the, when I went to Channel 2, because I'm waiting for people to call back and I watch TV until people call back and I, I saw one, as the listings were scrolling up, I saw it, the Cove on the Knowledge Network. Oh, 
I didn't think anything. I just remember I saw that, the cove, and I'm like, mm. and then I'm still waiting for phone. I'm still calling people, and then I'm, I see it pass by again. I'm like, is that what those guys were talking about that day? The cove? They're all, you need to see it? Ah, who cares? I gotta go out. I gotta go meet people. I gotta go chit chat. I gotta socialize. I gotta be me. But nobody's answering my calls. Half the channels aren't working. Nobody's answering my calls. Nobody's calling me back. I'm like, what the fuck? And this went on for about an hour. And I saw that documentary thing go by like a hundred times, but I never even bothered watching. For like an hour, nobody called back. But then guess what? Now the next hour comes, so they show you the listings on the next hour. Now it's on again for the second time, the COVID's on again. Like right after they showed it, they're showing it again. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm like, why is nobody calling me back? I'm like, going fucking crazy. And I was like, let me see what else is on. So I'm clicking through stations and half the channels are like that black and white snow. And I'm like, fuck, nothing else on. So then I started thinking to myself, this is when I, something hit me. Then I was like, I don't know, am I supposed to stay home to watch this or something? Like, is this that fucking, no, fuck. Am I? So I'm like, yeah, so I clicked on it. And the first thing I saw was the most evil fucking thing I ever seen in my life. This fucking Japanese guy on a boat stabbing this dolphin, and the dolphin's making these crazy noises, trying to like, and squat, fucking blood off. Ocean was all blood red, and I'm like, what the fuck? I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I'd never seen something like this before. It, it was dolphins, you know, you never think of dolphins like being like tortured and fucking stabbed to death. I've never seen anything get stabbed to death before. I started crying like a little pussy. Couldn't believe it. I'm like, like I, I didn't understand what I was seeing. And then I got tears running down my face, but I didn't know I was like that upset. I was just, I, I just, fucking blew me away and I, I just lost my marbles I, I fucking and then I remember at the end of the documentary so distraught and I saw that one guy that was inside of this building and he had a little TV screen on that he was walking around in front of all these people and he was trying to show them what's going on in Japan and none of these motherfuckers gave up flying fuck they just sat there like a little bunch of bitches that they are and didn't even care and I got more mad about that that nobody gave a shit and then I sat I don't know how long I sat there for it felt like eternity and I, I just my brain and my whole soul and my existence and all these things started fuck I started going nuts and then I was like, oh my God, I want to go kill those people, uh, those uh, Japanese people. I wanted to go kill them literally. And I started thinking all this evil shit that I wanted to do to them and slit their throats. And there was a group of people there trying to stop them. And I'm like, fuck, I should be there. These people should not get in trouble for this. I should get in trouble for that. And then I started, what the fuck? I need to help. I need to help. I need to help. So the first thing I did is I went upstairs to go see uh, so I meet in the fridge. And the first thing I said to myself is, man, all these animals, they, they get killed like that. I, I can't, I can't, I can't be a part of that. I, no, it's not who I am, it's not me. I, uh, yeah, I, I talked to my mom, I'm like, yo, I'm like, I'll never, she told me for years and years and years, Party, please stop eating meat. And I didn't understand why she would say that. It made no sense to me. I'm telling my mom this, and my mom's like, <laughs> not in these words, but you know, in the the way the gist of it was like, you stupid fuck. You don't need to eat it. I don't eat meat. All our ancestors never ate meat. Are you that fucking stupid? And then I was like, yeah, no shit, eh? None of you people eat meat in India for thousands of years. And that's when I was like, holy fuck. 
And then I just uh, started my junk food vegan diet. And uh, so I didn't know what else to eat. I just started with the junk food because like most vegans, it's just like, I don't want, I can't, I can't eat meat ever again. And then, um, you know, that, that, you basically reborn and you got to re-educate the mind and everything. And, you know, these, uh, these vegan groups actually helped out a lot because without them, it, it'd be that much harder. But with, with meeting all these other vegans by coincidence, maybe, or meant to be more likely that I see it now, the mind, the conscience, the soul, the spirit, it all started coming into alignment. And I started seeing the world completely differently. There's just nothing good about the, what we're doing these animals. Like the oppression, where does it start? It starts with the weakest species. And what we do to animals, man, cows are so harmless. And look what we do to them, holy fuck, man. Jesus Christ. It's just the most evil shit I've ever seen, man. And it blows me away. The fur industry, people wearing fur coats, not giving a flying fuck. Like, I never... Once I saw how these animals get skinned alive, they're strung up by the neck, and then get their skin ripped off their bodies. What the fuck? To look cool? Are you fuck? Are we fucking that disgusting? Like, as a species, are we... Are, like? Everything that I think every single day, all everything that comes up is like, we are the only species that destroys everything and tortures and murders and kills and does all this fucked up shit. And yet we, we call animals in the wild barbaric, the way they hunt and what they do and... Uh, fuck, I don't even know, man. I, I just get confused when I think about it. I'm just like, man, uh, you know, old raccoons are a nuisance, or seagulls are a nuisance, or birds are a nuisance, or this is a nuisance animal. And it's like, man, we're the ones killing them. They don't even want nothing to do with us. They see us, they take off. They don't want nothing to do with us. So just all these things that, you know, just, everything's fucked up. It, you know, we just can't seem to live in peace with anything. That's where it's fucked up. It's like... You know, there's going to be incidences here and there. It's just life, you know. But you learn and you live, think, right? People are stupid nowadays. They just, especially when I see people wearing fucking Canada goose fur coats and then they're walking their dog. And I'm like, fuck, what do you say, right? All of them, I just, you know, when you change your life for them and you see how hard it is for them, really. Like we as humans, we need clothing, we need shelter, we need people to take care of us, we need medicine, we need all this shit to survive. These animals, they're just born and they, and they try to survive. That's it. And they have it the hardest. So, I mean, realistically, uh, it's just, you know, I, I do all this shit the government says don't do. Oh, don't feed the animals. Fuck you. I'll feed them as much as I want to. Fucking put me in jail, kill me for it then. You know, string me up and hang me then. Fucking motherfuckers. Like, man, I, I don't care, I want to help. What the fuck, you gonna tell me not to help? If somebody's hungry, you don't want me to give them food? I mean, fuck, you know, like, it's a cycle. You know, that's where, we, that's where we learn all this stupid shit that one species is worse than another, so treat this one like shit, but be okay with this one? Like, how does that make sense, man? Like, it doesn't make sense. People, man, this, this whole world is fucking backwards, man. Especially fucking, ugh, it makes me sick when I think about it.